Hi, my name is Mary Ann Maldonado with the World Affairs Council of Greater Houston. Thank you for tuning in today, and whether you're watching or listening, I know you're going to enjoy today's program on Latin American Studies. Joined by my colleague, Veridiana Otamendi, our guest today is Paul Angelo. Paul is a fellow for Latin American Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. His work focuses on U.S.-Latin American relations, transnational crime, violent actors, military and police reform, and immigration. I hope you enjoy today's program. Uh, good morning. Thank you for joining us. I am lucky and fortunate to have Paul Angelo from the uh, Council on Foreign Relations, and he's going to be explaining us what's going on in Latin America and if there's something good in upcoming. So thank you again, and please. Thank you. My pleasure to be here. Um, so I think it, it probably is best for us to start out uh, in looking at economic projections for Latin America for the coming year or years. Um, Latin America has seen pretty uninspiring economic growth over the past couple of years. The region's GDP only grew by 0.2% last year. Uh, now against the backdrop of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, the region's GDP expects to contract by anywhere between 46 and 5.2%. Um, as I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, many of the economies of Latin America are heavily dependent on commodities. Um, and commodities prices right now are at an all-time low. It costs more to extract oil to leave it there. Um, and so, whereas after 2008, at the, the recession of 2008, and the global economic downturn, we saw a country like China uh, stimulating the region with its sort of voracious consumption of the region's commodities, which helped Latin America weather the last global recession. Um, it's not likely that we're going to see that kind of activity or stimulus from the United States or China in a region in the coming years. Um, and so I think that uh, it's going to be a bumpy ride for, for Latin America for the foreseeable future. Um, another major uh, stimulus, economic stimulus for the region would otherwise be tourism and the services industry. Uh, more than 50% of uh, the people who are employed in the formal sector in Latin America are employed in services and largely in tourism. Uh, but, you know, just this morning, the Argentinian government announced that it's going to shut down all air travel in the country through September. And I think that's yeah. sort of a, a sign of times to come uh, for the, the remainder of this year. Air travel is going to be affected. People aren't going to be visiting the region. And economies like the economies of the Caribbean, which are largely dependent on tourism, are going to be hard hit by this crisis. Another sort of factor, economic consideration that we have to look at is the, the role that remittances play in the re region, particularly in places like the south of Mexico or Central America. Um, in countries like El Salvador, 21 to 22% of the GDP is comprised of remittances that come mostly from uh, Salvadorans who live in the United States. These are sort of money that family members are sending back to friends and family in the region. And, you know, remittances tend to be the most efficient and effective form of poverty relief that we've seen over the past few decades in, in Central America. Uh, as we, you know, employment is affected here in the United States, both in the informal and formal economy, um, you know, the, the amount of money that people uh, and Latin American migrants will have to send back to their family members is going to be reduced. And so I think in the long term, uh, we're going to see that uh, the lack of remittance flows to places like Central America may actually encourage um, or be planting the seeds for another uh, cycle of mass migration from the region. And then I find, finally, I would just note in, in thinking about uh, economies across Latin America, um, dramatic percentages of, of, uh, of the so employed populations in these regions are employed in the informal economy. In places like Honduras and El Salvador, we've got upwards of 70% uh, of the people who are employed in the country are uh, employed completely outside of uh, formal um, job uh, um, opportunities. So that means that these people generally do not have health insurance. These people do not have uh, access to minimum wage or social services. Um, and against, uh, in the context of the coronavirus pandemic, I think we're going to see um, a lot of people left in an increasingly vulnerable state in societies that were already very fragile to begin with. Yeah, and I was just reading that a weak economy also helps the rise of populism. 
Could you elaborate a little bit on this for us, please? Sure. I, I, I mean, I think it's also useful to look at where we were in Latin America prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, if you'll recall that in the fall, there was a, a period of popular unrest across the region that was rooted in frustration, uh, um, mostly frustration over corruption, inequality, and insecurity. Um, and um, now, you lay on top of that, um, sort of a long history of unending or low investment in public health, uh, in the public health sector, and a lack of access to social services that you see in many countries in the region. Um, it's created space for the region's populace to use the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, firstly, to channel this information, secondly, to rail against uh, government institutions, democratic institutions, um, which, you know, are, because of their deliberation and because of their representativeness, uh, tend to be much slower um, and may not be as effective or efficient at responding to something uh, as emergent as the, the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, but really, uh, you've seen um, some of the populists take control of the narrative uh, by, by villainizing experts. Um, you see that in particular in a country like uh, Brazil, where President Bolsonaro um, maintained for, for some time that the COVID-19 pandemic was actually a hoax. Uh, he's also insisted that Brazilians have a special um, sort of genealogical immunity um, to uh, the COVID-19 um, disease. And, um, and, and so, you know, I think that in, 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 in that framework, um, President Bolsonaro has also uh, challenged the, the high courts of the country, um, sidelined um, the social distancing and remain in place measures that have been imposed by the governments, uh, by the governors, excuse me, um, of Brazil's uh, states, and has even come out against members of his own cabinet. Um, we've seen a series of uh, resignations to include uh, the, the health minister. Um, in a country like Mexico, President Lopez Obrador again was very slow uh, to accept uh, the risk that uh, Mexico would face in dealing with the pandemic. And uh, we, you know, this sits against the backdrop of Pres uh, President Lopez Obrador's um, you know, railing against regulatory bodies in the country, um, uh, railing against the media, his political opponents in, in parties like the PRI and the PAN. Um, and now he's, he's sort of been able to seize the narrative. And whereas at the beginning of the, the uh, pandemic, um, he had approached uh, the, the health risks in much the way that he's, appro he's approached the risks that Mexico faces um, on the security front, more hugs, uh, less social distancing. Um, now, uh, AMLO has now changed his tune um, and has begun to take more seriously the pandemic and the risk that it presents to Mexico which is a country that, fa that, that could potentially see upwards of 700,000 potentially lethal cases of COVID-19. And so uh, it, from sort of the federal government, uh, the response now has done a complete 180 and we're seeing very stringent uh, restrictions being encouraged um, by uh, the, the central government in Mexico in such a way that actually we're, we're seeing um, su supply chains that, you know, for PPE or critical medical equipment uh, that depend on inputs from uh, manufacturing plants in Mexico are, are, are being disrupted uh, because of the Mexican government's insistence on uh, closing down industries, and particularly in the border region. Um, and then I would also point to just another example of, of populism uh, or, or a populist leader taking advantage of this crisis to consolidate support uh, for him and his movement, uh, we look to the case of El Salvador, where President Nayib Bukele, uh, who came to power last year, um, sort of on an anti-corruption uh, reformist platform, um, largely seen as a political outsider, even though he had worked his way up through the system in various parties. Um, it, President Bukele right now uh, enjoys a higher than 90% approval rating among Salvadorans for his handling of the crisis. That being said, in the last two months, he's has uh, basically uh, come out against uh, the other branches of government and disregarded uh, 
um, the preferences or rulings of the Supreme Court uh, and the legislature, um, which I think sets a very dangerous precedent for a country that already has a long uh, history of anti-democratic uh, rule. And so I, 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 I am worried or I would, I would caution um, us to, to really pay attention uh, uh, sort of the way that populists in the region may be using this crisis to accelerate uh, an existing process of democratic backsliding, which we've seen uh, across the region over the past several years. And do you see any um, success stories in the region? Yeah, I, I would point to a couple of countries in the region that, uh, for the most part, have handled the COVID-19 crisis well. Um, and I, I think, you know, what this pandemic has done for us, is it's, it's sort of exposed to us the fault lines in Latin America, that populism in Latin America is not a, a, a left-right phenomenon, but rather a phenomenon between populists and technocrats. And so, uh, whereas, you know, you have a government that uh, is sort of left-wing in orientation, like uh, President Lopez Obrador in Mexico, and you have a government that is right-wing in orientation, like, the, like President Bolsonaro of uh, Brazil, both are populists. Um, but we've seen a lot of center-left and center-right governments in the region respond very responsibly. I would point to President Piñera in, in, in Chile, um, who had very low approval ratings prior to uh, the COVID-19 pan pandemic and has now seen his popularity improve because of his handling of the crisis and his elevation of public health authorities as, the, as sort of the, the real, um, uh, as the real experts on how to manage the crisis. And the same I would, would be said of the, the center left administration of President Fernandez in Argentina. Um, and so, you know, I, I think uh, we've seen, you know, popularity of those two, two leaders uh, improve uh, because they have left the handling of the crisis uh, uh, to the experts. And so, again, I, I would just underscore that the, the fault lines in, in Latin America vis-a-vis -vis, um, this crisis are not necessarily le left right, but rather uh, those governments that embrace populism and other governments that are in, in embracing a more technocratic approach. Okay. Lastly, what is your favorite city in Latin America? <laughs> oh, um, I, I mean, I love Mexico City. It was the, the first place that I traveled when I was a 15-year-old, uh, um, and uh, I'm forever indebted to the city because it, it inspired me to further explore the region. But the city in which I've lived the most and, and where I sort of have um, sort of abiding obligation is, I would probably have to say, Cartagena, Colombia. Both beautiful. <laughs> well, thank yeah. you again for uh, this amazing insights, um, for your time and for your disposition, and we look forward to seeing you again, and um, stay safe in New York. Thank you. Thank you very much. Take care.